Hi, welcome to another episode of I Own a Business, where we focus on helping practice owners grow the practice of their dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Vargo, and I have with me here today, Dr. Larry Golson, who is owner of Envision Eye Care and also Sherpa Consulting, which implements an entrepreneurial operating system called Traction that we'll dig into. So, hey, Larry, how are you doing? Hey, good morning. It's great to be here, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, Larry, before we get into the meat of, of what we're going to talk about today, I wanted to first ask you a question about success. And I, and I think if we, uh, I think a lot of people would base success initially off of how successful their business or practice is, how much money they make, how much revenue they generate. Um, I've talked with a lot of practice owners who make a lot of money, but are very burned out, are very stressed out. And um, based on your practice and your, and we'll get more into your practice model as we go along, but I sense, I get the sense that you value freedom and liberation. So my first question for you is, what does success mean to you? That's a great question, Steve. And I, you know, think about our society and, and our culture. And I think that the overwhelming response would be how much money one makes. And whereas financial, like the amount of financial uh, amount that somebody has is important. I feel like that's part of it. I feel like the other, maybe even more important is, is physical and mental health. And so when I think about success, it's, it's all three, it's financial, it's mental, and it's physical health. And it's the balance of those three, because I know personally, I've been unbalanced before. And when I opened my practice cold, I worked really hard and my health suffered. And so I learned a lesson early on that, you know, we have to seek balance in life to have true success. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people, I don't think I actually know because I've talked to so many that, that have that success, maybe as society sees it, you know, they've got the money, they've, they've got the house, they've got the car, but they're just a lot of, uh, and it's not unique to optometry, but just lacking happiness, lacking, I think the quality of life. I, I think sometimes we work so hard to get to a certain point that we forget um, that, you know, a, a big part of being an entrepreneur that we should unapologetically pursue is is the kind of quality of life we want, which for a lot of people is is actually perhaps not seeing patients quite as often or quite as many days, having more time and freedom to do the things that you want to do, um, but also the ability to kind of give back in, in other ways beyond just, just serving your patients. Um, so I said we'd dig a little bit into your practice model. So Larry, if you could just kind of give the uh, some background on your practice uh, the history of your practice, and how did that lead you to consulting for other practice owners? Yeah, sure, Steve. So I opened my practice cold in 2008 in Asheville, North Carolina, in an area that was pretty saturated with other practices already, but I kind of knew I wanted to be in a spot, a specific spot in that city, and figured that if we did really good quality care connecting with our patients and our community that we would still be successful. And even though we opened right before the Great Recession, um, we grew for the first six years by about 30% just to you know kind of grow into a more of like a medium-sized practice. And we moved to a bigger space in 2014. And we ended up with a team that was about eight or nine people, and that's when we started to see like subcultures form in our in our overall culture culture, and realized that we needed stronger leadership, and so that began the quest to really understand how to manage and lead a team at a higher level so that we could continue growth in a more sustainable method, and so eventually I needed to get out of the exam room to be able to have the time and the mental capacity to be a better leader. I hired another doctor part-time at first, eventually full-time, and it allowed me more uh, time and space to be able to make sure that the culture stayed strong. And so we grew really fast those first six years, but then we actually kind of stalled out and had negative growth one year. And it wasn't until the leadership improved that we started to see a more sustainable long-term growth. And so I started to realize that I enjoyed 
managing the practice and practice development. Actually, I, I enjoy patient care too, but I couldn't do both. And so I chose practice development. And so kind of over time, the model was to work myself out of the exam room. And after that, it became, how, well, how do I grow leadership even to the point where I'm not even involved with the practice on a day-to-day -day level? And so that's where we're at now. The model is that I'm more of an owner, almost like a consultant for my own practice. And it allowed me the time and space to help other practice owners do the same and liberate themselves. And listen, some, some owners that I work with for practices, they, they want to be in the exam room, which is fantastic. You know, it gives them time to do that. Other practice owners want more of what I have, which is just, you know, a little bit more liberation from the day to day. And so whatever, whatever the desire is or the goal is, Sherpa Consulting, the, the consulting firm that I run, really helps practice owners achieve their own dreams, which is a really cool thing to be able to do. I'd like to get more into that and, and the traction aspect of it, because a big part of your consulting is built around that. Um, but let me, uh, let's explore this leadership topic a little bit more, because that's something I came to recognize right away. When I started consulting, I was unaware of how important leadership was till I started seeing how many of the problems that were uh, in that were that were happening in a lot of practices were because of a lack of leadership. But you mentioned a few things here. You mentioned creating the time, and and I I understand that some doctors actually prefer to see patients more often, but I just think there's no way around it. You've got to be able to carve out some time to take on that leadership role in the practice. Otherwise it tends to default to the, the most vocal per staff member I find. And that can be a good thing if with the right person, but, but more times than not, it, it becomes a bad thing, right? Uh, a couple other things you mentioned were, and, and things you can do with that additional time, were building the culture and growing the practice. And those things typically don't happen uh, passively. They don't happen when you're spending 85, 90% of your time in a small dark room in the back. So um, can you just build on that a little bit? You're, what have you come to realize over the years in terms of leadership? What areas did you need to be involved with to make these things happen and to grow a successful practice? Yeah, so I, I believe that the overriding theme for me, well, first, let me step back. When I, when I first heard that term leadership or lead team, I remember thinking to myself that that was, it, it almost seemed like it was, I don't know, like a conceited or like, un I didn't really understand what it meant is what I want to say. And I, and I didn't really think that it had that much meaning or bearing on the practice. And the more I started to read different books and talk to different mentors and consultants that consulted for me uh, in my practice, I started to realize just how important it was. And any human system benefits from good leadership. And good leadership is not something that is necessarily one is born with. We have all these ideas in our, our mind from the military or from, from teams or coaches where these natural born leaders lead a team towards success and achievement. And I think the reality of it is, is that leadership is a learned skill like any other. And the more you practice, the better you get. And so I like to tell potential clients that um, I made so many mistakes myself in my own practice that the main benefit of those mistakes is how much I've learned from them. And so when I did not lead with intention and skill, I did have that experience, Steve, where a person in my practice, the most vocal one, became kind of like the mother hen and everybody would share their grievances with her and she would come to me and say, well, we're feeling like this and this is how, you know, we want things to be. And I didn't really know what to do with it because I wanted to be a good, good boss. I wanted to be a good, you know, leader to my team. I just didn't know how. And what I come to learn is good leadership is born through a good balance of support and challenge. And those two, if you can think of like almost um, on two axes, one is support and one is challenge. Finding the balance between that for the right person at the right time in the right situation is what leads to really good leadership. And sometimes it requires more support for somebody and they're not in a place that they need to be challenged or should be challenged. And then sometimes it does require challenging somebody at a higher level because you know that they can do better. And so through 
the support, we call the support challenge matrix. The other piece of that is how to communicate. And I learned a lot through a book called Radical Candor. We talked about that before, Steve, with, um, with I believe her name is Kim Scott. And she really described how to, the subtitle of this book, I love it. It's called How to Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity. And so the, the kind of like duality between support challenge and good communication is what has really helped build my leadership, which in turn, I've been able to build leaders in my practice that can do the same. And so part of it is about multiplying good leadership in the management of an organization. So Larry, let's dig into the traction aspect of this, because I know that's a big uh, component of the work that you do with other doctors. What was it about? Well, maybe give people a little bit of background on what that is, where that comes from, but also why did that resonate with you and, and how have you implemented that into your practice? So Traction is a book written by Gino Wickman and it's it's become a really important business entrepreneurial system for a lot of different industries. And I think it got to the point in my practice where it felt like we were taking two steps forward and one step back and we wanted to be good leaders and grow a very sustainable organization, but we kept running into road bumps and speed bumps and along the way. And it got to a point where the pain of not changing became bigger than the pain or the challenge or the pain of changing into a better way of doing. And so at one point, one of my coaches handed me this book, literally handed it to me and said, you need to read this with your manager. And we began reading this book, didn't really know what it was at the time. and came to learn that it's an entrepreneurial operating system or an EOS that helps an organization align the vision of the organization with the structure in other words, like the people and how they're structured and what they do in the organization. It promotes accountability in that system to collectively achieve results. And, you know, I was told by one coach at one time, you know, there's no one recipe that's going to help a, a organization be successful. And at the same time, this is a really great template to help help an organization organize and provide clarity to their team and drive results so that people understand what their role is and they know how to do a good job at what they're what they're hired for. You mentioned something before, and I'm curious how much of traction involves this. You mentioned creating other leaders. And I think that's a really big component of anyone in a leadership position is eventually you need to be able to scale yourself, right? I mean, whether it's a, you know, when you start off a cold practice, right? It's you and one other employee, and you are the doctor, you're the technician, you're the optician, you're the janitor, you're the plumber, you're, you're everybody. But as the practice grows and you hire more people, that's really where leadership skills um, play a bigger role. Because now you've got more people, you've got more human beings there that bring in their own strengths and weaknesses and personalities. So leadership, that ability to pull everyone together and get everyone operating on the same page, but eventually the practice creep keeps growing and you need, I guess we just consider a manager. You need more uh, people in the organization that can take on a leadership role that can kind of be your point person. So now you got seven, eight, 12 employees, right? You need somebody else. So the ability to create other leaders, how does traction factor into that? Well, the, the way traction factors into that, and you really nailed it uh, as far as like how a practice grows, it starts with one or two people and, you know, you, eventually you need a manager and you're growing more and eventually you need leads or managers below the overall general manager. And so one of the questions I get a lot is, is my practice big enough for traction or am I ready for something like traction? And the answer is, Really, traction can help at any any size. And I wish I had done it sooner. I opened my practice, as I mentioned, in 2008. I wish I had read traction in 2007 and started with it. But, you know, as it was, it didn't come until later for us. And the way traction helps with understanding how to build that structure into a 
practice is through one of the documents that's created as a result of traction. It's called the accountability chart. And, and a lot of organizations call this like an organizational chart, but it's basically describes, usually it's the practice owner that's at the top of the organization and they're called the visionary. And below that is the general manager. And if the practice is big enough, Steve, there's leads below that and they're separated into departments. And so depending on the practice size, you might have a optical slash marketing lead. You might have a operations lead. Um, you might have a clinical lead. And so if you could picture almost like a family tree, the visionaries at the top and then below that is a general manager and then below that is the different leads of the departments and below those leads are the people in those departments. And so as the organization grows, so does the accountability chart. And Traction just gives really great clarity on how to create that. And it's gonna be different for every single practice. And what is also in those boxes is not only the, the title, it's the individual's name, and it's uh, maybe like four to six bullet points of what they do in the organization. And it really helps to clarify who goes to who for what and who's responsible for what outcomes. There's two things here that I think a lot of practices and probably businesses in general, again, this is not unique to optometry, struggle with. And one is the ability to, and this is again from a, a leadership position, in a lot of cases for optometry practices, this would be the doctor, the ability to relinquish control. <laughs> and the other one is is holding people accountable for outcomes. So it sounds like that's a, that's a part of this. But I, I I do think, again, when everything's dependent on you, you everything starts to move very slow, and you also don't get the input and buy in from other people because other people you you want people collaborating and coming to you with their ideas but when you're a bit of a control freak in that sense people will actually stop coming to you with their ideas because why do it so the ability to to relinquish control but again accountability as well holding people accountable for outcomes and say okay well let's try things your way even if it's not always the way i would have done it let's try things your way but let's sit down um at a, at a future date and let's look at how this is working. Do we need to, is, is it working great? Do we need to pivot? Do we need to stop doing it? That's where the accountability comes in. But I think in general, people like to see their own ideas succeed. So I think you start to get more, as you say, traction, momentum within an organization when people feel like uh, their input is valued and they have a voice in the, in the um a voice in the process. Communication is such a big part of this, as you know, and communicating with one another. What What is the process in your practice for, you know, I mean, if, some offices, it's, it's a weekly meeting. It's a staff meeting. What others, it's a, a morning huddle. But but bringing everyone together and communicating what the outcomes, expectations are, how do you handle that in your practice? Well, accountability is such a big topic for most practices, including my own, and it continues to be. And the more accountable an organization is within itself, the more successful it'll be. It's about as straightforward as that. And it's a simple fact of doing what we say we're gonna do and trusting that others can do the same. And so as a practice owner, we are doctors, we're, we're business owners, we're marketers. Like you were saying, I mean, they're administration, HR, there's so many different hats that we wear. And it's one thing to do it when you're small, but as the bigger you get, you must, must, must delegate and elevate. And if we don't do that, we're going to limit our own growth. We're going to limit our own success, however we define it. If it's financial success, that's going to be limited. If it's mental and, and physical health, it's still going to be limited. And so we must be able to trust others, and they must be able to trust us to build the organization that we want. And so it's based in trust. And through that trust, we start to realize that even if somebody is going to do something different than we would have done it, if we get to the same endpoint or even 80% as good of an endpoint as that we would have gotten ourselves, then we have to be willing to say yes to that. And what we do when we do that is we empower others to start making decisions. And as you said, Steve, it's like trusting that they can do something well and we can relinquish control. And the way to do that is, is, you know, again, first by building trust, but also by asking questions instead of giving directives. And asking the right question 
to the right person at the right time is one of the most powerful advantages great leaders have. And we're basically wanting them to come up with the answers because if they come up with a solution or an answer or you know, a way to solve a problem, they're much more willing and likely to follow it through to be accountable if they came up with the idea themselves. And so I really like to have my leaders come up with solutions. A lot of times they'll come to me with problems and my initial response is, well, what do you think we should do about it? What do you think we should do about it? And I want them to come up with a solution. And sometimes they can't, they need a little more support in that moment. So I'll, I'll throw out, well, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that idea? And other times they come up with a better solution than I ever would have if I had been in charge of, of coming up with a solution. And so that really will build an organization because that builds leadership, it builds confidence and empowers others to have a stake in the work that affects them. There's also the possibility, possibility, Larry, that they come up with the same solution that you had, but it feels like it's their idea. And there, there's a phrase I love to use, let the other side have your way. So instead of going <laughs> to somebody else and saying, here's what you're going to do, this is, you know, do things the way I want you to do it. When you ask, again, you all we're doing is flipping it around and asking the question, what do you think we should do? Now, maybe they come up with something better. You know, as long as they're not going to do anything that's going to cost you the business, right? I, I think it's okay to give people that that freedom. But a lot of times they'll come up with an idea very similar to the idea that you would have had, but it feels like it's their idea. And then you just grant them, you know, go for it. And now it, it feels like it, it's their idea. It doesn't feel like something's being pushed upon them, which is more likely to get, sometimes you run into friction that way with, with your employees. Um, so Larry, as far as strategy is, is great. I think it's good to go in business with strategy, but sometimes strategy is nothing more than a few ideas bouncing around in your head or something you wrote down on a cocktail napkin. Outcomes are what matter, right? That That's what's going to make the difference. What kind of results are you getting? So through this process that you've implemented in your practice, tell us a little bit about the outcomes that that's um, led to for you. So the desired results that we wanted when we decided to implement traction, and I will say that it takes a, it takes time and dedicated effort to implement such a process. We realized we the desired results we wanted were organization, more clarity, back to more accountability, and really sustained growth. The results we achieved were all of those things. And what we also saw along the way as results or outcomes was an improved culture. So we, we had, once we implemented traction and, and to this day have the best culture we've had in our practice and it is sustained good culture and all of our businesses have, have a culture. The question is, is it a positive culture or is it not a positive culture? Is it, is it helping us or is it hurting us for what we want as outcomes? And what we recognize is that there are no neutral actions. So that every action, every conversation, every decision is either moving our practice in the direction we want it to or moving our practice in the other direction. And so with that great culture that we now appreciate in our office, the individuals have the environment set up to do the best work of their lives. And it is such a cool thing to see, Steve, is because they are excited to come to work and they're in a good mood when they leave from work. And that's not to say that that happens every single day because it certainly doesn't. And we still have issues that come along in our office. But by and large, we have a lot of people moving in the same direction at the same time. And the results that we also learned as a result of implementing traction is we, we learned how to hire the right people and we still miss sometimes but by and large we, we hire more of the right people and we we have to when we have to let somebody go there's no surprise when we have to terminate a position or somebody resigns it's it's really clear that it just wasn't the right fit and so we get to that process a lot quicker we don't hang on to the wrong people for any longer than we need you know then we recognize that they're not the right fit and we typically leave on amicable terms. And it's just like, hey, go do your best work somewhere else because it ain't happening here and it's all good. We collaborate together as a team at a much higher level with a lot of understanding the vision and the purpose for the practice. What that's resulted in and the outcomes is also decreased turnover and increased retention. 
And in this day and age of having challenges finding talent and hiring and keeping the right people, that's been a major advantage for us in our practice. Another result is an increase in our growth. And I, and I want to mention that we have grown in the last two years, one year by 32%, and the next year, this past year, by 22%, which is a lot of growth for an established 15-year-old practice. But all that growth comes as a result of everything that I mentioned before as outcomes. And when the right environment is set up for the culture and the people in the practice, the results and financial results come as a kind of like in the wake of all that other positive nature of the practice. And so I know that a lot of practice owners desire growth and I do too. And, and I'm talking about, you know, revenue and profitability, um, but that can't be what's most important. And it certainly can't be what's first that comes as a result of everything else that's put in place to achieve that. Yeah. If you're doing the right things, I think that's the natural outcome. It's interesting the focus on the, the staff and the team and, and building that culture. I recently interviewed Sharon Carter, who consults with uh, practices as well. And she said that a lot of times people will ask her, what is, your, what is the first thing you do? How do, how do you, when you go into a practice to build these multi-million dollar practices? And her response wasn't, I, I help the doctors build multi-million dollar practices. She said, I build the people who build the practice. And I think that's such a key transition when, when you switch from that mindset as a doctor that I, I'm the one responsible for building uh, a successful practices to thinking in terms of I need to build the people I need to build the team who's going to build the practice and that's really where leadership leadership kicks in so um, Larry this has been great um, thanks so much how do you um, uh, just tell us a little bit about as we close out here how does Sherpa work with practice owners um, and and how would they find you? How would they uh, search you out? Right. So we work with clients by first client contacting us because they're interested in, in making change in their practice. And we do a discovery call and kind of understand where a practice is or where a practice owner is versus where they want to be. And a lot of times as a result of that discovery call, we you know submit a proposal to them and then discuss how it would look to work together. And probably very similar to Sharon Carter, we understand that we have to build leaders in the practice and we have to basically get everybody to come along with us for the journey. And, and we help practice owners through that by first establishing their vision and kind of like why they exist. And Simon Sinek, uh, who's a very popular uh, speaker on business and organizations, he says, start with why. And so all of us practice owners, we have entered into ownership for a reason. And I kind of had it in my head before I did Traction, Steve. I kind of like understood, you know, why I did it, but I never really wrote it down. So first is establishing the vision, and then it's establishing the goals. And before Traction, I had never thought beyond a year or two of where I wanted my practice to go. But we help business owners think of what's their 10-year target, what's their three-year picture, what's their one-year goal, and then diving down even deeper into 90 day goals and how to get weekly meetings to have really a lot of impact and and purpose. And so we have criteria that we want to think about when we work with clients. And that is that the owner has to at least have one day a week where they're not seeing patients. And we just can't really work with, with clients that, you know, the owners work five days a week inside the exam room. We also want our, our clients to not necessarily have like any major practice changes in the next six to 12 months, as far as like moving into a bigger space or bringing on vision therapy or something like that. Cause with practice, you know, traction does take a lot of, you know, focus. It doesn't take a ton of time. And I like to explain that to clients too, that it's, you know, maybe a few hours a week, but it's very consistent and it does involve some reading for the owner and the leaders. And so when we work with clients, we, we either do like a, you know, kind of call me when you need me type thing. But what I really like working with clients is a very focused, what we call the summit package. And it's a 
time frame that's built around implementing traction in the practice at a really high level. And so depending on the practice's needs, we kind of make a um, proposal to achieve, again, where they are now versus where they want to be and how to get there. Yeah. The um, I, I think just listening to you talk and talk about it, it doesn't take a lot of time, but it takes a lot of focus. I had the opportunity a while back to interview Brian Moran, who's author of the a book called The 12 Week Year. It's a New York Times bestseller. So he created a system for setting up goals, which obviously this involves a lot of leadership well and meeting with your team and setting up accountability meetings. But he said one of the, the top reasons that businesses fail to, yep. to see these things come to fruition is they just leaders just give up too early. That, that one of the hardest parts early on is getting everyone to change and stay with it. So, um, you know, as he said, just keep keep at it, keep showing up, keep pushing up. Dr. I'll cite another person that I, I recently interviewed, Dr. Janelle Davison. She was talking about more about implementing a dry eye specialty, but she said, just grind for six months and keep pushing it. It's going to feel in the beginning, you might not feel like you're winning, but if you keep showing up and keep grinding, eventually it's going to work out. I, I would say the same with this, anything uh, new system, uh, new strategies that you want to implement. It might not feel like you're making as much progress in the beginning and getting you know, change management is very difficult and getting staff to change and adopt new ideas, but eventually it, it's not change anymore. It starts to become the new normal. But as a leader, one of the most important things is to just stay with it. You're not always going to get it right. There's no perfect leaders out there. Uh, they don't really teach us this in school, but just keep showing up, keep leaning in, keep getting better. We mentioned some books today. There's a million, there's no excuse for not learning about leadership. You can, you can say, I'm not a great leader. That's fine. There is zero excuse these days for not um, learning to become a better leader. There's just too many books, too many podcasts, too many resources out there. So just keep learning, keep developing that, that part of your skills. So, um, any, any parting words, Larry? Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And it's one of those things where we have the response. I see it as a responsibility, Steve, as far as we're the owners, the leaders in the practice, and it all lands on us. The ultimate success of the practice is up to the top leaders. And so it is a consistent effort over time. I like to tell clients that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I also, you know, if, if, if folks are interested, I also urge people to reach out after they hear this podcast, because life is going to take back over after we hear this. And we're going to remember about 8% of what we discussed today on the podcast. Uh, we can be reached. I'll, I'll give my email address. If anybody's interested is Sherpa biz consulting at gmail.com. And I just want to urge people to, and our website is Sherpa consulting.net. I will urge people to, to reach out if they're interested in learning more. There's obviously no obligation, but I, I'm so passionate about the changes that this has made for our practice and the other practices that I work with that I really, you know, we really just want to help and, and help people understand that this is a consistent effort over time to achieve the practice of their dreams. Yeah, thanks, Larry. You, you make a good point. I think when it, I could talk about leadership all day long. And, and if you do find yourself in a leadership position, you almost have to walk up to the mirror and say, no one's coming to save me. This is, you know, I am responsible for this. And, and the ramifications, there's a lot of outreach here, right? You're not just responsible for you, your success of your practice your family, but you've got employees, you've got some responsibilities to them to create a, a wonderful practice, perhaps your employees, families that depend on on that job, certainly your patients and the quality of care that they get. So again, um, yeah, I, it, it's a great topic. Appreciate the work that you're doing. People know how to get in touch with you. So thanks so much for your time, Larry. Awesome. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure, Steve. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. If you'd like more information about IDOC and how we work with ODs and practices to help them grow their practice, then you can find out more at IDOC.net. So thanks again, Larry, and thanks everyone for listening.